Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, that's February the 2nd. I'm glad to be here. Uh, this is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room is open. And I did pop a link in there to what we were talking about last week and this week. And uh, yeah, I'm just having some coffee and waking up. And glad to be here. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate everybody who's catching the shows and uh, for taking the time to do that. For um, A lot of people listen to the archives and I really appreciate everybody who's tuning in. Um, yeah, I wanted to continue talking about how does physical abuse affect children, and that's from HealthyPlace.com, www.HealthyPlace.com. And um, we were talking about the emotional side of, of child physical abuse and the damage done to you know, the emotional um, and the psychological damage done because of child physical abuse. And so that's what I wanted to continue looking at. Really, um, last week and this week, I've sort of been really talking about mainly uh, the graphic uh, issues of, of the physical abuse that I suffered as a child, especially. But, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows. I'm talking about abuse, and abuse is a sensitive topic, right? It's a very sim- sensitive subject, and a lot of people find it very uncomfortable to listen to, right? And so you have to be sure that, you know, you're in a safe enough place to listen if you're a, if you're a survivor and you're just on your healing journey, right? Be very careful what you're listening to. Information like this type of information and, and anything like that that you might see on TV or be reading or, or hearing or listening to, it could, it could trigger you, right? And so you have to know what's good for you to listen to, and, and everyone has to listen at their own discretion. And, uh, you know, because you, you have to know what's good for you to listen to, right? So I don't, you know, sugarcoat it. I just tell it like it is. And so, you know, you have to listen to all of my shows at your own discretion. And young people under the age of 18, I just ask, you, ask that you have uh, permission to listen to my shows because I believe in protecting children. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dream Catchers for Abused Children. And, you know, we're fighting to save children's lives, right? And that's what we're doing. And we're all, we're all uh, very, very much, you know, wanting to stop child abuse, right? So you have to... As, as young people under the age of 18, you have to keep yourself safe when you're online and you have to know how to keep yourself safe in a chat room. So if you're not sure how to do that, make sure you do get that information and keep yourself safe. You don't want to be a victim of a child sexual predator or pedophile. You know, you need to keep yourself safe, right? If you're a parent listening and you don't know that information on how to keep your your children safe, you know, make sure you do get that information, right? It's very important. All you have to do is type into your browser um internet safety or online safety for children or whatnot, it'll give you some good tips on how to keep yourself safe, right? You can find all kinds of websites with that information on there, right? And, uh, you know, I'm not a counselor or a therapist. I say that on every show. I just want people to know, you know, I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own blog talk shows and and I'm just a survivor and I, I just want to be one more voice, you know, to talk, to talk about this stuff and get this out in into the into the public, you know, stream because... So it's just the whole issue of silence, right? Abuse has always been a problem. Abuse has always been around. But, you know, it's always been silenced. It's like people, you know, even today would like to see people, you know, to, to see it silenced, right? For many reasons. The abusers want to see it silenced so they can keep doing what they're doing. And uh, survivors, you know, quite often are silent because of the shame and, and whatnot that surrounds it. And also because of fear. They might not... Their abuser might still be living, and they don't want uh, any repercussions, so they don't say anything. And so many times people never, ever disclose the abuse. Society wants to keep it silenced because this way they don't have to deal with it. You know, what we don't know about, we don't have to deal with, right? And the top, the, the situations of, of abuse, and especially child abuse, are so discouraging and so disgusting, you know, that most most of society really doesn't want to hear about it because it's very disturbing, and, you know, people are thinking, well, do I have to hear about this? You know, it'll ruin my lunch, right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> excuse me, these kids out here who are being abused, you know, their lunch has been ruined years ago. And so I just have an issue with that, you know. Society just wants to close a blind eye and pretend it's not happening so they don't have to get involved. And, um, you know, the rest of us are not going, well, well, we know this exists and we know it's that it's happened and, and we're survivors of this and, and it never should have happened. And there's kids out here right now and little babies and children out here who need uh they need our help right so that's why this whole issue of silence is bad news and that's why i'm doing what i'm doing you know i I wanted i just decided i thought i can no longer stay silent and um, i'm so thankful for everybody who's out here you know speaking out against child abuse and doing whatever you can to stop child abuse right so you have to listen at your own discretion and 
And uh, you know, just know I'm not a counselor or therapist. I'm just I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own shows. So we'll get into this topic here. And we left off yesterday talking about the emotional impact, <clears throat> emotional impact of child physical abuse, right? And they said that you know, there's uh, children who have been abused can experience a number of emotional issues, you know, emotional consequences because of child physical abuse. They said that. Um, Abused children compared with non-abused children may have more difficulty with academic performance, self-control, self-image, social relationships. And a recent U.S. study comparing physically abused and non-abused children provided considerable evidence of the negative and lasting consequences of physical abuse. The physically abused children in the study experienced far greater problems at home, at school, amongst peers, and in the community. They said they, that children who are physically abused have a predisposition to a host of emotional disturbances, and they may experience feelings of low self-esteem and depression, or they may be hyperactive and overly anxious. And many of these children may exhibit behavioral problems, such as aggression towards other children or siblings, other emotional problems such as anger, hostility, fear, humiliation, and an inability to express feelings. And um, so this is where we kind of left off yesterday. The long-term emotional consequences can be devastating. For example, children who are abused are at risk of experiencing uh, low self-esteem, depression, drug alcohol dependence, and uh, increased potential for child abuse as a parent. And so it's a huge issue, you know. I mean, I was talking about this all last week and this week, and uh, what, you know, the abuse did to me, I know, you know, because I know firsthand what it did to me, but just watching what it did to my brothers and uh, to my sisters and, you know, the other children that I knew who were abused when I was growing up, I knew lots of kids who were growing up in these abusive environments. And, you know, it was horrible, absolutely horrific. You grow up like that and you spend your whole life in that. That's, sadly enough, that's the norm. And so, you know, many times young people, you know, they abused as children, grow up to be, you know, teen, teen, teenagers or older teens. And if abuse has just been your life your whole life, you know, you don't even, you wouldn't think about, um, you know, if you saw a child who was being abused, you wouldn't, if you didn't get any help and you grew up in that, you probably wouldn't even uh, phone or, or, or alert somebody, right? Because it's the norm, right? And that's the problem with that, because it just re- it just perpetuates the cycle of abuse, right? And um, <clears throat> it's not good, even if you know that it's wrong, because you know that it hurt hurt you to be abused. You know, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you would do the right thing in this situation, because when children have been abused and brought up in this sort of situation, their minds aren't thinking like somebody else outside of the box who has not been abused who knows that it's wrong and knows that they should report that they should get some help and and, and alert the authorities, right? And so it's just a huge, huge problem, right? And many times, not every child who's been abused would go on to abuse their own children. That's a fact. Um, It's just that some do, right? That's the cycle of abuse perpetuated. And it's like, you know, some of my siblings, we didn't have very many children out of seven children out of my seven, well, there were seven of us. You know, there was four bro- my four brothers, and there was three girls. And out of that, there were three grandchildren. So, you know, there weren't a whole lot of, you know, kids born from us because um, my brothers didn't have any children except for one of my brothers who um, adopted a son. So, from his wife's uh, previous marriage. So, this, he, he, you know, he's her son, not not my brother's son, right? Even though they're adopted, they're not blood right, related, right? So none of my brothers had any children, unless they had some that we didn't know about it when they were adults. You know what I mean? But um, the the sis, my sisters, I had two sisters, and one of my sisters, the oldest, had two boys and uh, treated them horrifically. They don't really even know about this stuff. Like my nephews, um, one of my nephews was killed by a drunk driver years ago, so he's gone. But my other nephew, who's left, he um, probably doesn't realize <clears throat> what his mom was doing to them when they were little, right? Because I don't think anybody would have sat there and said, did you know that your mom was, you know, um, my my mom actually was their protector because even my mom's charges, like, she, she loved other people's kids. That's the problem with that. She always loved other people's children. She just couldn't love her own. And that's, uh, people find that very hard to believe. But you know what? When your parents are, when when, when two people are in a in a in a marriage and, and it's gone completely sour and they have these kids that they did not want by this by this man or this woman you know it, they're not happy to have those children right 
But other people's children are not part of that problem. They're not part of that situation. So my mom loved other people's kids. Absolutely, you know. And she treated other people's children very well, right? And um, But then she could curse and beat on and, and spit on her own children and her own children around. But yet she could be so loving and kind to other people's children. And I mean, I saw this and witnessed it when I was growing up. And it used to bother me. You bet it did. Because I was like, well, why is, you know, she's so loving towards these people's children. And yet, you know, when I come home, it's like, you know, you're you're a whore, you're a slut, slapping me around, you know, uh, threatening me to, to throw me out of the house, especially as a young teen, which was ridiculous because I wasn't even like one of these teenagers that I would think would be sort of causing problems like just being promiscuous and getting in trouble with the law and stuff. There, I had a, just a few incidents of things that happened, but I was actually a, quite a good kid, you know what I mean? Um, I really was not out really doing all that much uh, harm to people. I was mostly doing harm to myself. But the thing is, is you know, for her to for her to treat other people's children so well and then not treat her own children well, it's really something to see. Because that's why most people thought my mom was just this most wonderful person. They'd be like, oh, your mother, she's so wonderful. And it's like, right, <laughs> okay, well, that's because you don't have her coming down on you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's the whole issue. Um, it, it's harsh. And and so my sister had two two kids that she did not want. And, you know, she even said later on in life that, she didn't really want children. She didn't love her her kids like she really like she should have. And she said because she hates kids. And my sister maintained that um, all the way through her life that she hated children. And any time like my other sister had a daughter, uh, one daughter, and uh, my niece, and she was now on the other hand a very good mother. Um, she did not abuse her daughter, and uh, she did my my sister who's just a little bit older than me. She did a great job bringing up her daughter. And she did the best she could. She divorced her husband, who was abusive. Thank God. I'm so glad he, she got rid of him. And um, But she didn't abuse her child, which is great. Right? My niece had a good life, and she knew that her, both her parents loved her, and that's wonderful. And uh, But you know, I'm glad that my sister got out of that marriage because it was very abusive, and she would have ended up probably just like our parents, right? It was horrible. And so I'm glad that she's out of that. But the thing is, is she was a good mother. She was good to her daughter. But my oldest sister, whenever my little niece was, when my niece was growing up, my little niece was a baby, my oldest sister wouldn't let her come over to the house because she didn't want any children around. So she'd be like, no, you can't bring your daughter over here. She, my sister would tell my other sister that she was not welcome in her home because she had this little daughter, right? And she didn't want this little kid in her home. See, my my oldest sister hated kids. And the thing is, is I, I sit back and I think about it. People would say, isn't that horrible? And I think about it and I'm like, yeah, it is, but that's how my mom was, right? My my oldest sister was just taking on the behavior of my mom, really, you know, even though my, my mom loved other people's children, she didn't want any, she didn't really want us, right? But my oldest sister actually even went even further than that to say that she just didn't love any kids and actually didn't want any children around. So my, my oldest sister was actually very warped because of the abuse that she suffered and um you know she was the oldest i'm the youngest and there was 18 years in between us and so she saw a whole different type of abuse um she was moved out of the house by the time the authorities were called um she was just moving out of the house right and she would have been a young like not a really young teen kind of a maybe 16 17 years old when the authorities would have been, um, not no, actually, no, she would have been older than that when the authorities, because I was two years old. She would have been 20 years old when the authorities were alerted. That's right. So before that, she was in the middle of that horrific abuse that was going on in the home, right? Because she was still living in the home when she was 16 or 15, 16 years old. And that's when there was a story that my sister actually never talked about, but there were other people that actually told me years later who actually were there and were my sister's friends uh, in the neighborhood there when they were growing up, that my dad was um, extremely abusive towards her and that my dad, especially my, well, my mom was too, but my dad was too. And that one time she was outside um, talking to her friends in the front yard and my dad wanted her to come in. I guess he came home from work and he wanted her to come in the house because my parents were very sick and thought that they were should just be able to just order their children around, drag them around and whatnot. Well, my sister didn't want to go in, so my dad tore her shirt and bra off in the middle of the street and threw her down in the street and bra on, and she was like probably 16 years old. So my dad, you know, horrible, horrible people, right? These people that would be everybody would look up to now. Like uh, there's people that actually just love my parents. That's why I'm doing this <laughs> because <laughs> there's people. I would hope that everybody. I hope. I just pray to God that all of these people sat around and these 
with these with these blinders on, we'll get a real good clear picture of what my parents were like, right? And because it's really funny, you know, that so many people are like, oh, I just love your parents or loved your mom or loved your dad. It's like, right? Okay, good for you. Um, yeah, no, the truth had to come out, and uh, it, you know, we didn't deserve any of that stuff, not any of it. And the reason, main reason why I'm doing it is it wasn't even for myself. It was for my brothers. I really wanted people to know what happened to my brothers because the the world just thought my brothers were just losers, right? They were just like, oh, your brothers are just losers, and you know, even our parents would be like, oh, your your you know, my sons are just losers. My sons are, you know, even though they were the cause of the of my the behavior that my brothers were exhibiting, they still blamed my brothers. You know, oh, we just have the worst kids. You know, the most the most rotten, evil kids, right? So here's my brothers, you know, doing, you know, coping and trying to stay alive in this environment and, you know, doing what they were doing, uh, which wasn't good. But the thing is, is who, who's responsible for that? My parents were. My parents were 100% responsible for that. And so for the for society, you know, of course, wouldn't know that my brothers were abused, you know, unless they went back and started digging in the, the records. And, and, you know what I mean? And there's so many people that just thought, oh, your brothers were just losers. They just... You know, they were drug users, they were you know, out of jail and prison, and they were just bad people, you know, and, I'm, and I love my brothers, you know what I mean? And to watch them and to watch that, that systematic abuse that was going on in my home that killed my brothers, you know, and then to have people put them down and run them down, including family members, you know, who don't know because, they, you know, there was some, like, for, well, the one the immediate kids know, knew, right? All of my siblings know what's going on, but, you know, my nephew, for instance, and my niece, have no clue what was going on because by the time they came around, grandma and grandpa just loved them, right? Right? Grandma and grandpa just loved their their grandkids, but they hated their own children. And that's the problem with that, right? So then there's people that think, oh, we just loved grandma and grandpa. It's like, well, I'm sure you did. And I know they loved you, but they hated our guts, right? Let's just be honest here. And, um, you know, that's the problem with that. It's absolutely harsh for... It destroys families, and it destroyed our family, right? So not only did it destroy me, uh, you know, my own my own being, my own um, spirit, my own um, my own person, it, it destroyed the whole family, right? And that's why I went public, and I really wanted people to know, you know, I mean, how serious this stuff is, because this is absolutely horrific that any child should ever go through this. And I had uh, six siblings, right? So it does bother me. You bet it does, right? To watch what happened in my family, it just it just rips me up. You know what I mean? Uh, but I'm ha- you can't change the past. You can't go back and change the past, right? So I had to realize that because that's the whole issue. I was just told, you know, take away my pain, right? And I and I even four years ago, right, just was sitting there on the couch, just thinking, how am I ever going to be out of this pain, right? And then I realized, I thought, wow, I can't change the past. That's for sure. But I can change the way I feel about myself. And I can change the way that I, you know, handle things in life. I can, I can, I can help myself instead of hurt myself, right? And so all these realizations started coming to me that I didn't deserve any of that stuff that was put on me by my parents and siblings, right? Mainly my parents. And it's like, it's horrific, you know, it's horrific. But I sure didn't deserve it. None of us do. So all of this stuff can lead to esteem, depression. Drug alcohol dependence. That's what happened to my family, right? My parents were both abused, right? So they were abused as children. So they had low self-esteem. They had, they were depressed. They had all kinds of issues with depression. My mom was manic depressive. I think my dad. I don't know if he was manic depressive too, but I think he he, he probably was. But he, they they diagnosed him just borderline schizophrenic, and with other some other issues. And like he he was really schizophrenic, not just borderline. Um, drug alcohol dependence. My parents were not drug addicts, but my dad used to. If he could get a hold of bottles of NyQuil and things like that, he would drink that cough syrup, things like this. He was more into just trying to, abusing over-the-counter medication, right? Um, but my parents were not drug addicts, but, but you know, quite a large portion of their children were because of the abuse, right? Uh, just turned to drugs. An increased potential for child abuse as a parent. So, yeah, my parents passed the cycle on. That's exactly what they did. And it's absolutely horrific, you know. And then, you know, there's people out there today that would sit there and, oh, we just loved your parents. It's like, okay, good for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, isn't that nice? Uh, good for you. You just keep your little nice thoughts there, you know what I mean? Whatever. Um, we all know the truth, right? The rest of us, that are there's only a few of us living now, right? But 
pretty harsh. Social impact of physical abuse. The social impact on children who have been physically abused is perhaps less obvious, but still um, substantial. Immediate social consequences can include an inability to form friendships with peers, poor social skills, poor cognitive and language skills, distrust of others, overcompliance with authority figures, and a tendency to solve interpersonal problems with aggression. Um, that's a huge issue. <laughs> you know, if you try to live like that, you know, you have no ability to form, you know, friendships, poor social skills, you know, poor cognitive and, and language skills, distrust of others. You know, mo- children, all children who have been physically abused would not kind of, you know, necessarily have all of this stuff, you know, going on in their life. But, but, and I know myself, I don't have any problems, you know, making friends and, and things like that. I never have. But I have a problem with people that if somebody does something to me and it hurts me, I, I'll just cut them off. Like I won't even consider the fact that, well, they made a mistake or you know, they didn't mean to do that or whatever. You know what I mean? I have a real hard time with that because I, I'm just, I just don't tolerate any more abuse from anybody. So I tend to tend to like blow friends off really easily because if they do do something I don't like, then I don't even give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, okay, you're gone, bye bye. Um, I have just no problem cutting people off, right? And that's I re- when I really care for somebody, I I try to to uh, you know look at the whole picture and and talk with them about the issue. But I've lost so many good friends because they've they've hurt me. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I refuse to take that garbage. You know what I mean? As an adult, psychological bull bull crap. Uh, from somebody who's supposed to be my friend, you know what I mean? Like bad enough that my whole entire family did not treat me right, but then to have friends do the same thing, it's like, and then not apologize. So if I don't get an apology from somebody who has hurt me, and I tell them, look, what you've done has hurt me, you know what I mean? And I don't appreciate it, and I really think you owe me an apology. And they don't apology, they are, they don't, they don't, they don't give me an apology. They are so gone. I mean, so fast, the door is shut, and it's never open to them again. And so I've, you know, that's one thing I kind of have to be careful with because, you know, I don't want to lose all my friends all the time. People are always hurting people, you know, and that's sad but true. Um, so this whole issue with trust, you know, you you really can't trust anyone. There's people that oh, you have to learn how to trust. You have to learn how to trust. I know I talk a lot about that myself, but actually it's not that. It's just that you have to learn to know that people will hurt you, and that anyone can hurt you, right? That's the whole issue. You can't go around trusting everybody. There's people out there that will get a hold of you and will hurt you if they can. You know, and as children, I mean, being growing up in an abusive home, I mean, what are, we couldn't trust our parents as far as we could throw them. You know what I mean? Because they were hurting us and they were totally untrustworthy, right? Um, so, you, you know, you can't even trust your family. So you, can you really trust a, a strangers? Well, sometimes you can trust strangers a whole lot more than you can trust your family, I tell you that. But everyone has the potential to hurt everyone. Right, I mean, you know, even us as, as growing up abused, we have the potential to hurt other people too, and we all have to be responsible for the way we're behaving, right? And so, what my my big thing is like, I'm willing to open up and and trust people, and because I want people to trust me. But the whole issue is is that everybody has to be accountable for their behavior. So if somebody does something that I don't like, and I call them on it, and I say, look, you know, I don't like that, or whatever, it's hurting my feelings, or whatever. Um, you know, it's 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 really hurt me. You know, and they just sit there and, and they're callous and they don't care. Then, then that's when I just call. I just say that's it. I say that's enough. The friendship is over. If you don't have the guts to stand up and stand up for your behavior and apologize, take responsibility for how you're behaving, then you're you're not in my life. So that's the whole issue. It's so important that people don't become revictimized, right? Because when you've been abused, it's real easy to, you know, to you have people telling you, you have to learn how to trust, and you have to learn, you know, and it's like, yeah, you, you do have to learn how to trust, but you also need to know that anyone has a potential to hurt anyone, right? And they do, and that's the sad part. And so, you know, you have to kind of know where your boundaries, you have to do boundary work and learn, you know, get into the, how to set boundaries, what you're going to allow in your life, how you're going to l- allow someone to treat you, you know, because that's what I did, right? And that's, you know, I thought, no, I don't want to be abused anymore. I'm so sick and tired of being abused. It was absolutely ridiculous. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, to grow up like that as a child and then, you know, still have toxic parents, every, you know, in, in your life all the way through, right, and toxic family, um, and then what, I want to take more garbage from other people, right? It's like, no. So I thought, well, okay, i got to give people the benefit of the doubt and i got to, you know, 
be able to trust them as as much as I can trust myself. But you you do have to know that you know people people have the potential to hurt everyone. So you do need to to know you have to set some boundaries on what you will allow in your life and what you won't. And uh, what you know we have to then know how we want to be treated. So it's very important to do that work. You know to to go through and do that boundary stuff. If you haven't done a whole lot of that, there's some great workbooks out there. There's um, the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, the ASCA uh, dot org. Uh, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse uh, Morris Center Program. It's called a Survivor to Thriver Workbook. And that workbook's like 130-something pages or 150 pages long. And we went through that like last year, last spring or summer or something like that. I can't remember now. It's been a while, but that's a great, great workbook, Survivor to Thriver Workbook. There's whole sections in there that talk about that whole issue of, of revictimization and boundaries and well, you know how you how you want to be treated. That's you know, and I figure, hey, I want to. Uh, that's how I want to treat people. How I want to be treated with respect and dignity, you know, and concern, and um, you know, I don't want to hurt people. So that's how I would like to be treated. I don't want people hurting me. I'd like people to treat me with respect and dignity, and concern, you know. And um, so we have to, you know, know how we want to be treated, you know, and not allow ourselves to be re-victimized as adult survivors because it's so easy to do. Like they're talking here on this uh, when they said that distrust of others, over-compliance with authority figures, that can happen <clears throat> because children who have been abused, especially physically abused, you know, when you have somebody beating you violently and, you know, and you're just in the corner and you can't really even defend yourself, you know, you're trying to defend yourself but you're just being beaten up. Uh, on a regular basis, right? The, the, you get around other authority figures, you know, for, for the police officers and whatnot. It's a real issue because you're either going to go one way or the other. You're going to be over compliant, or you're going to be um, completely the, the opposite and become hostile, right? Because some people don't have a problem with uh, that type of thing, right? And so that's those people that don't have any respect for authority, right? And then there's the other side of it where people will just do anything. Uh, that anyone tells them to do because they're afraid of confrontation. They're afraid of, you know, because when you're being beaten as a child, you know, there's not much you can do about that. So it's, and psychologically, it does kind of um, damage your, your psyche, you know, and you feel that you cannot say no, you know, or that you, you can't uh, stand up for yourself, right? And that, that that's what happens to a lot of people who have been abused. We will we, we cut some time, like really get into that. That's uh, a huge issue with with people who have been abused, whether it's child abuse or domestic violence situations, domestic abuse. You know, people just it, it messes with your mind, and people really feel then that they don't have rights, that they they have to take what's coming um, because when you're abused as a child, and you you are forced to take what's coming, and that's all there is to it. I know, growing up like that, there wasn't anything I could do, um, slight of running away, which would have just put me in you know in peril on the streets, which I knew. But the thing is, is you know, there's much you can do, right? As a kid, you're, you're really vulnerable, right? And so, you know, you then later on in life, dealing with authority figures, you know, anyone who, like bosses, um, you know, people throughout my life have always kind of thought of, of me as a brown noser, right? And that's because I always, for some reason, and I'm sure it has to do with the abuse that I suffered as a child, um, am interested in pleasing the boss, you know what I mean? Because I was interested in pleasing my mom because I didn't want to get in trouble. I wanted to stay on her good side, even though I never really could get on her good side. Um, didn't matter how good I was, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it just didn't help. But the thing is, is, in my adult life, you know, I still tend to do that. And I'm very much interested in what on and, and uh, people kind of see that as brown nosing. And for me, um, for me, it's probably just a trained, like a learned behavior. Right, I am absolutely sure it's a learned behavior. So there's so there's so many issues, um, you know, that, that adult survivors have to go, you know, have to kind of look at what's going on in your own life, right, and then you know work at, on each little each one of them, right, as they come up and and sort of see how, you know, because I I mean I was self sabotaging for years, and I I think I'm who who knows I, I probably still do a little bit of that without even realizing it, right, but I have done a whole lot of work, so I can recognize now some of my stuff that I was to self-sabotage, right? So it's so important that we don't do that, right? You know, we, we deserve to have a good life, and it was bad enough that we had other people abusing us, whether it was our parents or someone, um, you know, and then what? And then we're going to continue on the mess as adults and continue to uh, self-sabotage? All that's doing is just allowing the abusers to win, you know, and that's what I was doing, and I thought, no way, man, I want to have a good life, you know, and so we have about a minute left. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I had some great friends in the chat room, and, and thanks very much for being here at this time of the morning. Um, I'll be back on 
tonight, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio, and as well my own show after that. And um, um, tomorrow morning, same time, same place, one child to be a survivor to another. We'll pick up back here where we left off. But make sure you get help. You know, don't sit and suffer in sadness and silence, right? That's horrible. And, um, you know, we we you stick around, right? We deserve to have a good life, right? So my big thing is, you know, don't give up, right? Never, ever, ever give up. Um, you, you deserve so much better as a child. You deserve so much better now, right? So take good care of yourselves, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you again soon. And thanks for being here. Bye-bye.